our next segment uh, is going to be fascinating. Uh, we're going to be looking at the question of human nature in 2013. And for a long time, uh, some of history's worst ideas were predicated on the idea that, that humankind could essentially be remade. One of the fundamental ideas behind communism, for example, is that if you rejiggered how uh, property relations were structured, you could create a new culture and hence a new socialist man. One of the worst and most destructive ideas in the history of ideas. Fortunately, in the last couple of decades, uh, researchers have started to look at the question of human nature in the light of millions of years of human evolution, not only to determine how different parts of our bodies evolved, but how our minds came to be the way they are, the question of what makes a human being. And at the forefront of this research and in the public discussion of these topics has been Steven Pinker. He's the Harvard College professor and John Stone family professor in the psychology department at Harvard. Uh, he's written on topics such as language, cognition, the evolution of morality, and most recently, the question of violence in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. Please come to the stage, Steven Pinker. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. I'm going to resist the temptation of predicting some scientific breakthrough on human nature in the year 2013, because I don't think science, uh, most science really does work that way, that there is a eureka moment. We found the Higgs boson of human nature, and uh, we have to rewrite all the books. Uh, I think that research in many branches of, of science, particularly human nature, is much more incremental. Ideas build up, some studies replicate, others don't, and gradually uh, a new way of understanding people emerges. But I will mention one trend that I think has been growing over the last decade and I think will continue to grow, and that is understanding humans as moralizing animals. That if you ask what goes into human nature, there are obvious things like you know, memory, sexual desire, fear, color vision, but we're coming to realize that one component of human nature is the uh, urge to moralize, to pass judgment on others, to formulate universal principles and punish those who violate them. And you might think, well, this has tremendous practical applications because the world needs more morality. Maybe if we could find out what makes people moral, we could get people to do more of it. And uh, in fact, I would say the main conclusion from a lot of this research is that that's exactly the opposite of what we should do. That the world has far too much morality, at least in the sense of activity of people's moral instincts. If you look, and this became clear to me as I tried to identify the causes of violence at various scales throughout human history, from police blotters, where the biggest motive for homicide is not just amoral predation, a mugger killing someone to steal his Rolex. The biggest categories of motives for homicide are moralistic. In the uh, eyes of the uh, perpetrator, of the murderer, it's capital punishment, killing someone who deserves to die because uh, whether it's a spouse who's unfaithful or someone who uh, dissed him in an argument over a parking space or cheated him in a deal, that's why kill people kill each other uh, for moral reasons. That is true at large scales as well. If you were to tally up the largest episodes of bloodletting in human history, most of them would have moralistic motives. The uh, uh, Nazi Holocaust, Pol Pot, Stalin, the Gulag, uh, Mao, uh, the European Wars of Religion, the Crusades, all of them were killing people for, not because they wanted to accumulate vast amounts of money or huge harems of uh, women, but because they thought they were acting out of a moral cause. One of the reasons is that the human moral sense does not consist of a desire to maximize well-being, to prevent people from harm, but it is a hodgepodge of motives that include deference to a legitimate uh, authority, conformity to social uh, and community norms, the safeguarding of uh, pure, a pure divine essence against contamination and uh, defilement. That leads people to moralize many activities that don't do anyone harm, uh, homosexual activity between consenting uh, adults, writing a novel about the uh, prophet Muhammad, uh, striking up a conversation uh, if you're a single woman with a man that your father hasn't approved of, and so on. Violations of which, as you all know, can lead to actually rather uh, horrific uh, forms of violence. Indeed, one of the great trends over the course of history that I think has been responsible for the reductions of violence that I tried to document in The Better Angels of Our Nature is paring down the application of our morality and moral sense, working against 
some of uh, the inclinations that are built into human nature to moralize authority and conformity and purity to say really what we should attach our moral sense to, our moral emotions, is simply the maximizing of human flourishing and the minimizing of harm. That doesn't come particularly naturally to us, but I think it is one of the greatest sources of, uh, of progress. More generally, understanding the, uh, where moralization applies where perhaps it, uh, it oughtn't might give us some insight as to how to resolve some of the remaining conflicts. I'll just throw out one example. Uh, the, uh, we often wonder why the uh, Israelis and Palestinians can't just do what is obvious to the rest of the world uh, as the solution to the problem in the Middle East, namely a, a two-state solution, perhaps with some financial compensation to prop up the a nascent Palestinian state. European Union and the US, the quartet, could shower them with money if they agreed to stop uh, killing each other. The reason that doesn't work is that it, comp it uh, violates some commitments to sacred values that extremists on both sides uh, hold that the more you point out the financial and uh, everyday advantages of living in peace, the more they feel it's compromising these values that may not be compromised if you're going to be a moral person. Giving money to two combatants to lay down their arms is a bit, bit like suggesting to a friend who is uh, having trouble paying her bills that she turn a few tricks. It's a logical way to uh, bring in some cash. The reaction would be outrage. What kind of person do you think uh, I am? That's exactly the kind of reaction that you have when you suggest uh, breaching sacred values in highly moralized disputes. So I'll end with one uh, uh, quote that I have in the book from the great uh, analyst and uh, social commentator George Carlin, uh, when he said, the uh, world had the uh, Moral motivation is overrated. You show me some guy who's sitting on a couch watching game shows, and I'll show you someone who isn't causing any freaking trouble. He didn't use the word freaking, but uh, that's the, the general idea. Recru understanding, recruiting, and indeed minimizing human moralization, I think, offer is a great way to leverage an, a greater understanding of human nature to make the world a better place. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, one of the other things that's on our radar for 2013 in the, in the realm of violence, we've already talked about Israel and the Palestinians, the other is of course Israel and Iran. And the, it, it strikes me that the setup uh, is, is akin to a lot of what you talk about in your book in terms of the security trap, both mm. sides uh, essentially maybe being violent out of fear. What's going on there? What is, what is your research and your, your conclusions tell you about where that might be headed? Well, this, yes, this is an idea that goes back to Hobbes who got it from Thucydides that uh, um, this is a case in which temptation to violence uh, doesn't actually come from any irrational instinct, but comes from an instinct that's all too rational, namely two sides, each of whom is tempted to engage in a preemptive strike uh, out of the fear that the other one might engage in a, pre a preemptive strike. Uh, and a good analogy from Thomas Schelling is a homeowner who hears a rustling in his basement tiptoes down the stairs with a gun, sees a burglar with a gun, each one of them is thinking, I don't want to kill the other guy, but I, I may not have any choice because if I don't, he'll kill me, thinking that I don't have any choice. Uh, and uh, the, to get out of a security trap, the, the classic answer from Hobbes is you need some superordinate authority, a leviathan, a world community in this case, that would uh, put in incentives so that neither side uh, would fear being wiped out preemptively by the other. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the personal uh, sort of news you can use. You were one of the first people to have your uh, genome sequenced. Yes, uh, and uh, in which I discovered things like that I have the gene for fast twitch muscle tissue, for tasting bitter substances, and the gene for baldness. Uh, now this is... And, and how's your 40-yard dash? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uh, about as good as my, uh, as convincing as my baldness, but it made me realize uh, what a gene for X means. Uh, it, it, what a gene for X means is that someone did a study, they got together 100 people, they had them drool into a tube, genotyped them, and then they correlate genes with traits. And they found, for example, that one gene uh, correlated with 80% of the men in the sample who had the gene were bald, 
and at 20% weren't. So what does it mean to say I have the gene for baldness? It means I'm one of the 20%. So we're, it's actually part of a larger pattern where we're coming to realize that even though many human traits are highly heritable, and this has been well established from classic studies of adoption and uh, twins, finding the one gene that captures the trait is much more difficult. Even for physical traits like height, where we know height is massively heritable, uh, it's very hard to find a gene that counts for more than a millimeter or two of a difference in height. Uh, I think the, we don't know what the resolution of this uh, paradox, I call it Geno's paradox, uh, is going to be. There are two main possibilities. One of them is there are lots and lots and lots of genes for height, IQ, baldness, and so on, each with an itty-bitty effect, but of course you, in, you might inherit hundreds or thousands of them. The other is that there are a, a smaller number of genes that do have some whopping effect on a trait, but everyone has a different version. So in the case of, say, uh, uh, IQ, everyone is stupid for a different reason. Uh, we all have our, our, own, our own stupidity genes. With this conversation in the air about our evolutionary nature and uh, how it sometimes clashes with modern society, I, we've seen a couple of social um, or just trends like people eating the paleo diet, trying to mimic our paleolithic ancestors' diet and finding that they're getting health benefits out of it or uh, other things like that that are designed to mimic in some way our, our evolutionary environment. Do you, do you see any of those uh, happening and what's, what, what, are, what are some of the good pieces of uh, meat we're getting out of this discussion? I, I think there is some wisdom to that, but I have, uh, since studying the history of violence, I've kind of backed off from evolutionary romanticism, right. even though I've, I think we, it's crucial that we understand our evolved nature. But in, many ca in some cases, uh, uh, indulging our evolved nature will make us happy, happier living in more uh, uh, comfortable, harmonious circumstances. In some cases, human nature is the enemy. And I think that when it comes to violence, I've become a, um, a fan of modernity that uh, as violent as the world is today, it used to be worse. Uh, before there were settled states and governments, there were rates of death in tribal warfare that exceed uh, the worst rates of the 20th century. And that uh, as in the, dis the earlier discussion of, of uh, the moral sense, a lot of what we uh, evolved doesn't really make us happy living in big complex societies. And uh, we have to develop uh, workarounds for human nature rather than enhancing it. Okay. One of the big uh, topics that's been in the air also is, is the relation between the sexes. And there's been a couple of big articles on the cover of The Atlantic. Uh, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, friend of The Economist, you saw one of her predictions up here, uh, wrote a big piece about women in the workplace. And she's obviously fantastically successful, but described her yearning also to be with her children and, and her return to, to Princeton from Washington, um, partly predicated on that. Um, you debated uh, the nature of men and women with your colleague Elizabeth Spelka. Um, is there anything interesting that's coming out of that research that you think will, will hold up as we, as we look at the natural differences between men and women, what they want, what they can do, and so forth? You know, I, I don't think that men and women are biologically indistinguishable. Um, I think that there are some uh, emotions and, and drives that, uh, where there, there, there can be overlap between men and women, but on average they will differ. Uh, the reason I think this is less relevant to issues of, say, workplace equality or, or in general women's rights is that um, even if there are statistical differences, uh, in all these cases, the imperative is really to treat people as individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone is a little bit, a few points higher than what's the averages for their gender, a few points lower, it's both unfair to the individual and irrational for the organization to judge the individual on the basis of the mean of the, uh, of, of the race, of the gender, of the ethnic group, and the commitment ought to be to, to uh, uh, treating individuals as individuals. And that, that's one of the most hopeful points about this whole discussion, if only people understood that it's irrational to, be, to discriminate. I, I would say so, yeah. Well, let's take some questions from the audience out there. I know there will be a few. Start down here in the front, and then if I can see another, let's, number two will be the gentleman in the tie um, here. So first here, and then number two. Hi. Um, just, uh, you know, as we are at the relatively, you know, early stages of this century, uh, how would you look at, go about, uh, how would you go about um, advocating uh, the no harm principle as we move into a new world? Um, hmm. Well, I, uh, I suppose um, spreading the idea that it, that it is the um, uh, adoption of that principle that has actually led to many positive developments, that people often uh, despair that the world is becoming more violent, that the chances of catastrophic war are, are increasing. 
uh, having an evidence-based approach to trajectories in war and crime has a lot of good news that people are not aware of, such as that for all of the uh, headlines that we read about uh, uh, wars and oppression and violence against women, pretty much any time you try to quantify it, it's in a positive direction. Uh, so it suggests that um, the spread of the notion of human rights, for example, which is a kind of um, uh, prohibition against harm against individuals, as opposed to an earlier idea that the individual was just a constituent of some larger entity, like a, a nation, a race, uh, a class. The notion of human rights, I think, has done identifiable good, and you could see it in the numbers. The reason that it's so hard to uh, become uh, aware of this is that news is about the failures, about the episodes of violence that still occur. If uh, an episode of violence doesn't occur, that's not news, and so you don't hear about it. It's only when you calculate the uh, rate of uh, acts of violence that you realize how far we've come. All right, we have one here in the center, I think. Yes. Hello? Hello? Microphone. There we go. Uh, in the opening remarks to this talk, you suggested that human nature can't really be changed, and if it does, it takes a very long time. My question is if we think uh, that in some ways we can rediscover our human nature. I'm thinking specifically of the problem of homosexuality, namely that there's a lot of scientific evidence to suggest that it is something uh, inheritable, but if it is, how, what, what is the, the evolutionary benefit to maintaining it in a species if obviously they can't breed? Um, given this and the recent, the recent Supreme Court decision to take up Prop 8 from California, we're seeing an increased acceptance of homosexuality and an examination and a, and a discussion about it. Do you think this opens doors to discovering new things about human nature that in effect could approximate changes in it? Yeah, it, uh, the, homosexuality is an interesting case and uh, it's unlikely that uh, to the extent that homosexuality has a genetic basis, it's very unlikely that those genes were selected because they are disadvantageous in the bio biologist's strict sense of how many babies you, you pump out. Uh, so it, it's a scientific mystery why there is any genetic basis for homosexuality in the first place. Uh, it is becoming increasingly apparent that even if there was no evolutionary advantage, it does, there does seem to be some biological basis. That is, people really don't choose to be uh, gay. It's a, a feeling that comes over them as they approach uh, adolescence unbidden and, and uh, mostly uncontrolled. Uh, the question is, how does this, uh, how should this affect our attitude toward homosexuality, uh, both in the case of, of uh, laws restricting homosexuality, which fortunately have been um, uh, declared unconstitutional, and now it's advanced to the uh, issue of gay marriage. It, uh, for a long time, homosexuality was an exception to the general principle that uh, liberals like things to be learned and conservatives like things to be innate. Uh, homosexuality was the exception because the idea was if it is innate, then you couldn't choose it, therefore it's not a fit subject for moralization. Gay people can't help it, therefore uh, homosexuality should not be stigmatized or criminalized. Now I think this is, it's not a very good argument because if you restrict morality, as I think you should, to the uh, promotion of flourishing and the avoidance of harm, since homosexual behavior between consenting adults doesn't uh, harm anyone, in fact it, it, uh, it, it uh, enhances uh, pleasure, then uh, it shouldn't be moralized whether it is learned or uh, innate. And there's an interesting age shift in acceptance of homosexuality. You probably all know that young people pretty much have no problem with homosexuality. It's like gay whatever dude. Uh, but in addition, in addition to that change, there's, a, there's another change which is just as interesting, uh, which is that among older people, you can in part predict their attitude toward the moralization of homosexuality from their own nature versus nurture theory. Older people who think that homosexuality is innate are tolerant toward it. Those who think that it is a choice are intolerant. Among younger people, it doesn't matter what their theory is of the biology of homosexuality. They say it's no problem uh, either way. So we're seeing, I think, a, a beneficial change in moralization. Namely, you don't have to look for some biological basis for uh, uh, tolerating homosexuality. It's simply a matter of living and let living. Stephen Pinkert, thank you very much. That's going to be your last question. Thank you, ladies.